Hello, everyone. So we're get, we're going to start. Sorry for a late start. Um, we just tried to get everyone in here before we started. For those who couldn't attend or for those who are here watching at home, uh, we're going to be broadcasting this whole session, and then it's going to stay on YouTube. So feel free to write comments there and, and ask questions. We'll do our best to answer those. Um, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, at first, I thought not many people will come today. and It was a slow start, but it seems like we filled the house again. So whose first time is it now? I mean, great. So quite a bunch of people and 20% people. And who's been here for the number one event, the first event? Okay, so, so today um, we'll try uh, sl something slightly different. So we're adjusting the format based on your feedbacks. Um, today we're, we're going to have uh, two talks and then a pizza break, <laughs> and then a third longer talk, which is going to be a little bit more technical, a little bit more in depth. Um, so, yeah, sorry for not introducing myself just quickly. I'm uh, Audrey Azuz, CTO at BPTI. Founder at VC Labs. Uh, I guess most of you who came here the first time, first time know me already. Um, again, just to quickly run through for those who are here first time, why we're doing this is we're trying to gather an AI community together here in Vilnius, um, deliver presentations and paper reviews. So for those who don't know, paper reviews are where somebody presents the paper that's recently published, and people can go into detail into learning those. And our goal is to promote AI to the general public, provide you the resource where you can study and learn how to get involved yourselves into the AI community. So just to present today's speakers, the first speaker is going to be uh, Danielus, and he's going to give us a talk about how to start playing with neural, neural, neural networks. Then we're going to have uh, Ronaldo Zomer, who's a shepherd at Unity Technologies. <laughs> it's an interesting title. And he's going to talk about self-driving cars and Unity and some other things, I guess. Um, then, after the pizza break, uh, we're going to have a, an educational talk about convolutional neural networks and their types and all sorts of things that um, some, some of you might not be familiar with. But don't be afraid. If, if you're not, just keep asking questions. You can always interrupt the speakers. They're, they're happy to just um, keep this as a conversation. And. Um, before we move on with the first talk, I just wanted to thank everyone, especially Neurotechnology, who's uh, sponsoring this, uh, this pizza time. <laughs> so we're looking for different corporate uh, sponsors every time to sponsor the pizzas and the drinks for you guys to enjoy. Uh, we, we got a pretty good lineup up to date, but if you run a company and you want to contribute, you're welcome. We're doing this whole thing in an open source format so everyone can see where the money's coming and going from. It's, it's all sort of clear. We're, we just want to keep this community alive. Also, I want to thank RISE for hosting us. This venue is pretty great for, for events of this size. And uh, we get to stream these things up to, up to YouTube so everyone can enjoy them. And um, I just wanted to let everyone know, for those who are interested in deeper paper reviews about AI, you should check out uh, Neurotechnology's own meetup. That's going to happen on Monday. And they're going to do a um, paper review about some specific topic. It's usually about one to two hours per paper, so it's more in-depth. So for those who are really involved in this field, feel free to attend that too. So again, we had two sponsors. Um, pizza time, and we're looking for more if you're happy to join. And um, I'll get to this later. But before that now, let me um, introduce the first speaker. So, Danielis, are you ready to, to come on stage? So, uh, as a quick intro, Danielis is sort of a, an ultimate community member in hackathons, the things related to coding IT and then and makers community. If you ever go to one of these events, you'll fi always find him <laughs> twitching for, for the, from the amount of Red Bull he drank or, uh, <laughs> or coffee and always creating some interesting things. So I'll, I'll let him speak for himself, and I'm um, just going to run your steer. And uh, here you go. Can I see the slides? Yep. 
Hello. So, yeah, uh, I actually wanted to, another title, but I would just want it to me, for me to get politically correct. How, do you, can I have a clicker now? Okay. So, yeah, so I actually wanted to uh, name this talk, I Dare You, Mother, yeah, so, Mother, Father. Okay, this work. So, yeah. Uh, my name is Daniel and I'm sick today, but I still wanted to come here just to like speak to you because I think I can help you and then in like 10 years you may, will maybe be able to help me. So yeah, uh, for the past month or six, something like that, I'm working with Place I Live and we're uh, trying to create predictive models for homes.com, which is one of the biggest real estate uh, ad companies in the United States. So that's that. Basically, I'm unemployed. <laughs> Is it funny, yeah? <laughs> okay, so. Okay, so enough about me. I'm sick and I need your help. So I want to ask like few questions to better deliver this content. So how many of you are coders? Can you like raise hands? 40%, okay. Uh, how many of you use Windows? Don't be ashamed. <laughs> ah, okay, so, and what was the other one? How many of you that, okay, how many of you heard about deep learning but never actually started using it for more than an hour? Ooh, wee. okay, so that's ex exactly what I expected. And I'm here to change that. No, I'm actually here to change just like, let's go. So, yeah, so I'm, I just basically want you, for you to start training AI algorithms or deep learning algorithms. And I don't know, have fun, show it to your mom. Uh, don't show uh, the like digit recognizer to your mom because she'll say like, I can do that. That's my story. So yeah. And I, I, th I think the main problem is uh, with the AI, as uh, Udra said, this meetup is about uh, basically trying to tell the general public and people that haven't used learning or AI to like start using AI. But the problem is with AI that you always start with math and like, yeah, most courses start with math and like kind of complex algorithms. And I, I think AI could be like a basketball because like when you start playing basketball, you just like get a ball and you shoot and then like, I don't know, something happens and then you like start to play with your friends and then you can like start optimizing. Uh, but like if AI would be, no, like if bas basketball would be like AI, uh, you would first need to learn about parabolas, like uh, mechanics of the ball, and then after like five years, you could start shooting. Yeah, and then there's like this great book, Making the Learning Hole, it's from Harvard professor David Perkins. And it basically says that he, like if you want to educate as many people as possible, you, sh you must start with like easy, simple steps and then go deeper as the time passes, not as it is done in Lithuania. So yeah. So basically, I, I, I just want to like quickly go through the topics and yeah, and probably you'll get something out of it. So yeah, uh, so this is the like standard thing you've seen like, I don't know, 10 or 20 times uh, on the last meetup. So basically how machine learning works is supervised machine learning, yeah. Uh, so you have an input. So let's say it's, uh, I don't know, a girl. No, let's don't be sexist. Um, okay, so the classical example is like, you basically have a picture of a dog, then you put it into your model, and then it says a cat, it's a cat, and then you feed that uh, wrong error, and then you like try to tweak it a little bit, so if you say, if you give a picture of a dog, it should say it's a dog, not a cat. Yeah, and so basically, and okay, so, and you can do like all sorts of things, you can input, uh, I don't know, your weight, your age, and get the risk of getting cancer or something. Because, yeah, so, and then there's like this field of computer vision that it's, I don't know, exploding. And it, 
it has to do something with vision because like, like around 50% of our brains are involved with vision related tasks. And I don't know, it seems just cool that you can just feed pictures to a computer algorithm and you can get, I don't know, captions of that. I don't know, how many of you can write? <laughs> so yeah, so these are like, I don't know, Geek's ultimate dream. So okay, uh, and let's get to the actually particular stuff. So the basic thing I want to talk about today is image classification and why it was kind of hard till 2012 or something for us mere mortals. So the question goes as follows. If I give you an image, uh, what is the label of an image? And it's, of course, it's a badger, and it could be a cat or a dog. But the hardest part in like this algorithm is this feature extraction part. And you have to basically find a way how to mathematically or programmatically write an algorithm that could uh, distinct just numbers, a lot of numbers. And that was hard for like a lot of years and only the researchers uh, could like train those models because not many of mere mortals had the like access to resources. But that has changed and now your mom can train neural networks. Okay, but, but the reason why your mom can do that is because there were like these super nerds and at Stanford and they created what's called the ImageNet competition. And it's basically a basket league of super geeky computer vision guys basically trying to get uh, the as best predictions as possible. And it started seven years ago and it's now stopped. And it has 10 million annotated images. Like that's a lot. I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, and basically you, what do you have to do is like you see 10 million images and then you create a category. Basically there's like shitloads of images then a lot of categories, and then you get an unseen image, and then you need to predict its category. Yeah, sounds easy, right? And the, the funny thing is, like, uh, you see here, like, 2011 was the last year that deep learning wasn't used, and, like, immediately when deep learning was started to be used, like, the error rate dropped tremendously. It's like 10% almost. And as you see, it's now past human performance, whatever that means. Uh, but yeah, so there were like huge advancements and yeah, I'm still sick like. But okay, so again, the problem is that uh, you need a lot of data and like everyone is talking and talking and talking about that, especially three years ago when everyone was like, hey, I have a lot of data and was like, nice. And, and then you need GPUs, and I don't know, my friends don't have GPUs. Uh, and like, I don't know why. It just basically like, they have the money, they have the resource, resources, but they just don't buy it, and I don't know why. And also you need time, and that's, I don't know. We all have time, so. So, and I for forgot to tell you one thing, that basically these like, uh, small error rates are due to these filters. And what you do is, if you have a cat, you take, for example, this filter, then you roll it within a and then it like matches with one eye, and then it matches with another eye, and then, I don't know, it's an animal, and then you take another filter, and then you can like start producing some results. But the main point is that uh, the main part of these all, all the previously previous networks that won ImageNet, they are available for free. Not for free, like you still have to pay for your internet and stuff, but it's public. At least there's that. And I think that's the like main uh, thing that changed in like, I don't know, internet and, and all the IT industry that is that like we started really sharing everything and like, I don't know, magic happened and like everybody uses JavaScript now. So basically what I'm saying is that for now, you can just have an input, skip the hard part of GPUs, time and data almost, and then you can like have a nice label. So you can like, I don't know, have a picture of your mom and it can say that it's your mom. 
I don't know, sorry guys, like I literally didn't want to make these bad jokes about my mom. But. So yeah, and you've seen that this picture last time. So basically, visually, this you get this part for free. All this part, all these like colors. And then you need to change only like that small red thingy. Couldn't be that hard, right? So yeah, and the main, the main point is that like, for now, with this magic uh, transfer learning we're using of previous networks, now you don't need big data. And instead of like uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of images, you can like, you can't produce like state of the art results, but you can get something done at your like company. You can help, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, to classify cucumbers for your mom, as one guy did. Yeah, and now his mom is unemployed. That's a nice thing. That's a true story. Okay, so, um, <laughs> and Audrey said like I need a project but my Linux machine broke so we'll do this in theory like universities do. Uh -huh. So okay, we basically, there's a step uh, previously to that. We basically need to get a project idea and I would like to ask you but I can't and like I, because I can't edit on Mac. Okay, so we need to gather some data. That's kind of easy, right? Like you go to Google, download all the photos, and that's it. Then we need to label the data, so that shouldn't be that hard. And then there are like two different things we have to do, and maybe you don't know what they are. So it's basically you retrain that small, small part of inception, which was that, that red thing there. And then we need to predict a label for never seen images. Yeah. Okay. So, like, I wanted to be politically correct, but I wanted to be political too. And so, I want to, like, express my deep love for one, actually two guys. We'll be classifying these two politicians. And it's, it's a really hard thing. Like, they're different. No, they are similar. They both are politicians, <laughs> green politicians, yay. So yeah, uh, and yeah, so we'll basically, what we'll do is gather a lot of photos of this guy and that guy, and then we'll try to create an algorithm that would separate them. And so basically, yeah, you have to download a lot of photos of, of like those two guys, they can be different. Like you can take other guys or you can take girls just to be politically, no, sexually correct. And this is an oversimplification, like really, but it's like you can still get stuff done with these two folders. And okay, and you'll need Python. And how many of you have Python? No, how many of you don't have Python installed on your laptops? Don't be ashamed. Okay, so that's like seven guys. So for you seven people, I recommend this like Anaconda, just go to anaconda.com and download it. It works in Windows. And that's the magic thing. Uh, because almost nothing that is development related work on Windows. Yeah. Okay. And then you need to download the Inception script. And I made, I really made a nice uh, readme document and with all the steps that can document it. Just like go here. Yeah, you can take pictures. I'll drink some water. So you just made a script that helps uh, people to use Anaconda and Inception together there, and they can go and get it. Uh, yeah, and okay. everything's documented, so mm -hmm. you basically can like just go there, follow the instructions. I didn't test this with my mom, but it should work. That's a good idea. I should try it because like. Seriously, like when like COBOL was invented, the like inventor of COBOL, which was a woman, uh, she taught Kylie Minogue or Madonna, I think Madonna programming. So, like if 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 you can create something and like your mom can use it, so then it's like perfect. Okay, so basically, what what is in this script is like uh, you need to just like copy and paste these few lines. And so we're like executing a retrain by script, okay? And then 
what are you what you could be interested in is like how many training steps so this is basically for how many times the network will go through all of your images and see all of them and try to uh, classify them and the another option you could care is the image directory and it's like the files and this okay I will make a confession if you download this you'll get like do no 400 photos of Lithuanian politicians haha <laughs> spreading the disease charge. free of charge <laughs> yeah it's open source yeah you can contribute add photos of these two politicians and you can like create data sets and add dogs to it and <coughs> okay. sorry I'm still sick so yeah and then like so okay you now like you go here you run this script and then you run that script so basically it's like Python execute label image Python script and then you pass in the like image it has never seen and it's just, like says is it really Variga and you should get like results similar to mine it's like around 99% for one image it's around actually 80 because like generally because they're really similar man like if you're in the same party it's okay yeah and like and you maybe you'll try it with your own data and you can fail as I did like I don't know 80% is not that good so you can do three things actually you can do a lot more but so you can basically you can increase training steps which is by going here and like increasing this I don't know from 500 to a thousand or two thousand and another thing you could do what Vilus just like um, so you could go github and add more diverse pictures of these two guys because it's really hard to get normal proper pictures because all of the like uh, portals use the same ones and I don't know maybe take a picture of Ramona Skarbauskas and like, contribute it and Google is basically I don't know like how to increase the accuracy of inception or you can write it like Lithuanian AI group okay and that was the main part of my presentation and I dare you and I double dare you mother fathers <laughs> yeah. it's okay and yeah and the question for you might be like those that haven't heard like what deep learning is and how can you do it as what can you do now so I really encourage you to do one thing you can do all of them but like please do one thing it's like try to reproduce what I just like showed on the screen so basically is to like download the retrain script uh, retrain the network and then try to predict some photo and it all takes around five minutes I tested it today in Windows while being sick so if I while being sick could do it in like five minutes you can do better man and like okay and if you do that and if you reproduce the same results uh, you could try to find the project idea which I don't know it can be tricky but you could try to classify and add another party members and then maybe I don't know uh, add all, all of Lithuanian politicians and then you can visit fast.io and why basically basically why fast AI because they have that uh, top-down approach so that they basically start with really simple things and then they like make them complex as you go so it's kind of easy to go through first few lectures yeah and keep on deep learning I don't know like, hit the group of on Facebook uh, write some, some project ideas maybe create I don't know Lithuanian speech to text recognition that wouldn't suck okay and I have project ideas yeah uh, you could do a people ident identifier so basically you can have in your company or at your class you can have each folder for each person and then you could create a personal greeter uh, yeah that's what I did actually the second one the, about the tinder I did this in the hackathon like one and a half years ago so basically you download a lot of pictures of girls and or boys and then you basically play the game of tinder uh, you like just drag but you drag into folders and then you like pass that folder to the retrain script and then you have the model that can find you good dates yeah 
I actually write, wrote the woman, but then I like thought, well, man, this is not sexually correct. And okay, and that's like white tongue detector seems really weird, but uh, yes, it, this morning I went to my doctor and she asked me like, show me your, ah, uh, so she asked me to uh, show me her, show her my throat. Yeah. And she said like, well, your throat is okay, but your tongue is white. And I was like, so what? <laughs> like I'm a white person. <laughs> And <laughs> yeah, okay. So, but the the funny thing is that like I I was like, and she said to, uh, like you eat much garlic, drink way too much coffee uh, early in the morning on an empty stomach, and I was like, whoa, you could see that from my the color of my tongue. And I was like, man, you can create a system on that, and like. Yeah, you medical professionals better watch out. <laughs> yeah. And th that's it. Thank you. Uh, pardon my sickness and correctness. And please ask questions. Please give feedback. And I leave you with this. Thank you. So I have a question, uh, if you don't, guys don't mind. Where, where else could people look for, for, for good resources to learn about machine learning and starting off? And There's actually a really good group on Facebook. It's called Artificial Intelligence and Deep Learning. And it has a lot of like early, 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 early beginners from like India, Pakistan, Poland, and Sweden, like all over the place. And there are like... You can get the help there. It's basically a place to like ask dumb questions, not not dumb, but like beginner questions, like uh, how why is my model performing so bad, or I don't know how to teach your mom deep learning because I really think that can be done. And of course, there's this guy that uh, Audrey praises. It's Siraj, S S A R A J. Yeah, don't show them that. It's like man, it's like a meme. I guess I can show you a few few things. Um, so the last time, a few people after the meetup asked me where they can look for videos. So I think this channel is is pretty good because uh, they make it sort of fun. Um, I said me, man. And uh, they also have hour long coding sessions which you can follow through. So you don't have to feel sort of alone in, in developing these. You can watch a theory video and then you can watch an hour long video where you type together with the people on YouTube. So, so that way you can learn and reproduce projects and have prizes. And um, I think the one you told me about, three, three blue. Three blue, one brown. This is a really good um, mathematical sort of approach into, into learning this. This is a great channel. They explain a little bit more nuanced details of, of neural networks and mathematics in general that's behind it. So follow those also if, if yeah, you can. Yeah, they basically have a really good course on linear algebra with like visualizations and stuff. Yeah, so, sorry, so, so now the question time. Does anyone yeah. have questions for Danielis? Uh, hello, uh, I have a very simple question. Uh, what do you think from, from your experience, what is the optimal number of raw data, I mean pictures, for making predictions? And question number two is, uh, I'm not making project on computer vision, but uh, maybe I you meet overfitting problem in this project? Yeah, I meet a lot of overfitting. Uh, but okay, so the first question was, uh, how many training samples should you have to properly train a network? And I, can, I, can I say that bullshit answer? That like, it depends on the project, but it's true. Because like, if, you identif if you're identifying basically person from person, then you'll need a lot of data because like, people are really similar. But if you're classifying between dogs and cats, then, might be, then you maybe will be good with like, I don't know, 200 or 300 examples each class. But if you're doing the same with like, if you want to, for example, uh, yeah, like tell the difference between one person and another, then you need more. But, but then again, we're all talking about retraining the last bit of a network 
Yeah, so yeah. basically, it depends on on your problem domain, on the domain that network was trained previously, because you're basically uh, trying to fit this that competition. You have like a lot of dogs, a lot of cats, so these are good for these. But like I don't know, if you want to uh, if you want to classify faces, there are better uh, alternatives to inception. Any other questions? Okay, good. Let's give a round of applause to Danielus. Thank you very much. Thanks. So, I guess the whole point is if he can do it, then anyone can do it. <laughs> so, you, you should try. And if, if you need help, just go to AI Lithuania group as well. Give questions there. There's a pretty good community of 200 members, and we'll try to help out. So, I want to invite on stage the next speaker. Uh, for his talk. Yeah, whenever you're ready. Hello, uh, I'm uh, Renaldos from Unity. I used to do mostly graphics. Nowadays, I'm doing more of machine learning and AI. Uh, that's enough for introduction. So Unity is uh, it's a game engine. It used to be mostly game engine. We uh, do. We do tools that people can use to make games on mobiles, consoles, and desk. Yeah. I think this is much better. Okay. Uh, various platforms. So most probably you know Unity as a game engine. But mm, with time, uh, Unity becomes more and more of a uh, tool, not just for games. Mm, there is a lot of R R AR and VR stuff. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> keep talking, I'll keep fiddling with the okay. mic. Well, <laughs> so nowadays you probably seen some of the directors, like a District 9 director used Unity to create a movie. Well, and uh, Unity becomes more of a tool for simulations as well. So that's why you're probably wondering what, why I'm from Unity talking about the automotive and cars. So what is relevant? from what Unity has and why more and more people are uh, working in the automotive, uh, working on the self-driving cars, are starting to be interested in Unity and starting to, and we start to collaborate with us, is because uh, Unity is kind of good at physical simulations. It can provide you rendering and it can provide a world building tools. So the next question is, why would that be important for the, for the automotive? So I want to talk a little bit about this basically. I, closing the loop. So on the top there is a uh, there is a normal kind of way how how AI would look at the picture. Uh, imagine the AI cell driving AI inside of the car. It would look at the camera at the sensors, uh, try to understand the picture and create a model of the world or, or around the car in order to uh, be able to understand the world and then uh, plan the actions. And it generates an actions and that's how the car is moving. So in the game engines uh, or in simulation engines, what we can do is basically do the opposite. We can, do the, we can take the model of the world, uh, which is, say, scanned or created by the artist. We can take the actions of AI or actions of the um, some form of a, yeah, AI, uh, car AI, and we can, we can combine it, do the simulation, and we can end up with rendering and through rendering, we can up with the picture of what 
the car is seeing, basically. So we can simulate the world for the car, and we can render what the sensor would see. Again, why is that important? Yeah. So, uh, as well, you've probably seen that. You've seen the cars, a lot of uh, talk about the cars, how the cars now start to understand the images. They usually use these convolutional ne neural networks, uh, quite, quite related to the previous talk. Uh, and they can see, you can see that it's quite a normal way. Uh, they can detect different objects right through the sensors. They can see a dog and whatever, whatnot. Uh, there's another way how they can see the, the same thing. They can uh, not just select the object, but they, class, they can classify, they can say, okay, this, this particular picture in the image most likely is a car. Uh, this is the road, the trees and stuff like that. So it's basically different ways to uh, understand the images. And that is what AI nowadays is capable of doing it. The question is, however, how do they train that type of AI? What do we need to train this AI? Because it's not enough to take the ImageNet uh, images to train car AIs, right? It's quite clear, I guess. So in order to train it, we need a lot of video, a lot of images. And a lot of different environments, different weather conditions, and different lighting and whatnot. What car will see on, in, in real world. So companies like Google and Uber and other companies, are have, they are driving around with the cars and like this one having a, this is sort of for the street view actually, but they still can use the same, uh, same setups. They can film a lot of uh, data from an, around the world. So that is the training data, right? That's an easy part, kind of. The hard part comes next, is labeling that data. So in order to label that data, people sit and they actually take it image by image and put these blocks and say, okay, this is a car, this is a car, this is a car. So basically you need to annotate those images. You need to select the types, or object types. And to do that, you basically, that's a lot of manual work. It's, it's, uh, if you imagine hours of the videos, that's like millions, millions of millions of different images. And the, the, the funny thing is that what they do usually, like Google and Uber, uh, they would contract people somewhere uh, in India, for instance. And they go and they do the slave work, essentially. The problem is that when they do that, uh, apparently, they are below the, what we say nowadays is like AI is better than human, uh, they perform better than human at recognizing something. So these people are actually below the average human when they do the manual recognition, but they probably not paid enough or, well, they don't care. So it's, it's actually the, the, the joke what, what, what uh, Danny Lange from Uber, he did networks at Unity, he, he, he was saying that they noticed that, that classification quality didn't depend that much on the size of the network. They were hitting the kind of some uh, hard roof. At some point, they were trying to add more data. They were increasing the sizes of the network, strike different algorithms. But it turned out that the problem was in the classification, like the manual classification. Once they started improving the manual classification by giving it to more people, basically every image, they ended up that every image has to be re-labeled by at least four or five people. And that's where they saw an increase in the quality. So quite often the quality depends on the, 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 the annotation. So the I guess it's, the it's really hard to motivate people to do this sort of work as well. If somebody's yeah. just selecting yes. cars all day long, yeah. they get bored pretty quickly. Yes, it's, 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 it's kind of robotic work. There are the ideas how to make it more into a game, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> So it's a very expensive and time-consuming uh, task. Yesterday. So the idea is, what can we do? S and people start to come back to the simulation engines and rendering engines, look at the game engines, and creating a synthetic training test sets. So what we can do is, if we have a model of the world, right? If we create it, we can render it. And when we render, we g get an image. And nowadays, we can get a pretty decent image maybe not still not a completely photorealistic, but quite decent image. Uh, and then 
if you would mix it with the real images as well, so you can have a training set, which is some of them are real images and some are rendered images. So you can increase your training set, but the game knows you not only how to render the pixels, but it has much more information, like it can generate the depth, it can generate the different classes, because that is already like part of the scene, part of the world data that the engine is using in order to render. So we very easily we can get this so-called ground truth, the classes, velocity for the oil, for the cars and bounding boxes. We can simulate li lidars. Uh, well, we're working on simulating lidar, not yet doing that. Uh, so it's it's very easy for us to produce this this type of oh my god, <laughs> this type of data. So kind of sorry. Uh, so a little bit of the, another problem is how do we get a photo, more photorealistic images, right? We want to get as close to the camera, what the sensors see. So what is good nowadays in the engines, pretty much any engine, including Unity, has a physically based rendering, so that we take into account the light, how it works really well. Uh, people are very accustomed to photogrammetry nowadays, so we can have a lot of drones, a lot of taking pictures and re, uh, scanning the 3D objects and getting them into the engine. That's quite well developed uh, workflow. And uh, we started to integrate, like we have an integration with the ray tracer. So it's not a, you can now use a render which is not a game specific render, but more of a like what is used in movies or in. Uh, yeah, well, so so basically, quality. you don't need to run it as fast as you exactly. do for a human. Yes. It exactly. could be a lagging game, but it would still yeah. be good for the class. Yes, exactly. We, we can leverage the fact that we don't need to have real time, or we can spread the work on many, many machines. That's what people as well do, that put that rendering on the Amazon cloud and just crank a lot of images. Yeah, that, that's how the photogrammetry works integrated in the, in, in the engine. Basically, you can see a lot of cameras and then all the, some examples of the rendering uh, quality that you can achieve nowadays. But the next interesting step is actually, uh, this is from, I stole this from the paper from Apple from last year, I think. What, uh, what people do now is they take the synthetic image and then they train this, the GAN, like gener gener generative model in a particular way. So it can go from the synthetic image to a photo more photorealistic. So basically, you train a special network which takes our images rendered in a game engine and then improves quality on them. It, we, when we train that when network, we would give it a pairs of basically a synthetic eye and a refined uh, eye, or that's an example with the eyes, but in reality, that would be the, in the, in the automotive reality, that would be the images from the cameras of the cars. Uh, and by, by basically, it's, you, you, it's type of the network, like peaks to peaks type of networks, where you have a two, two images and you go from one to another. Like images go from zebra to a horse, or from horse to zebra, from sketches to images, and in this case, from a synthetic image to a refined image. And it can boost the quality, additionally. Uh, so our partner is saying that they're using guns it's a, a, actually a university in Spain. Uh, they're working quite a lot with that, and they're using guns. So the, the interesting thing that they noticed, it's like a bit of an anecdote, is that the guns, for some reason, doesn't really like people in the synthetic images, so it tries to remove them. <laughs> That's worrying. <laughs> it's probably something with the training sets that they use for the, for the training the gun, but it's kind of, yeah, weird. Uh, so that's one of the, one of the other projects as well that we're working right now with the partner is basically replicating a particular uh, intersection uh, from the real world and trying to model it and, and create a synthetic uh, data sets for the same like one-to-one -one mapping for the, for the real world. I'm somehow managing to double click. I'm sorry. Sensitive. Yeah. It's nervous as well. <laughs> it's not me nervous. It's no, no, it's the remote. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> so that's cool. The next, it's not a big thing. It should be a big thing, but. <laughs> so the next step is uh, still kind of creating these virtual worlds 
it's kind of expensive and, 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 and uh, laborious effort. It's much better than doing that with the cameras and then labeling that. It's better because we can change lighting, we can change environment, we can uh, easily move cars around, right? So it allows us much more variety, but it's still quite expensive. If you look at the game, like on the quality of the Grand Theft Auto, there's a reasons why it cost a lot, more than 100 million to make. Not all, all of it went into the content generation, but still, you can imagine at least one quarter of that money is creating a, uh, the content, and a lot of people working on it. So basically there's two angles that we're trying to attack that is integrating different data, uh, the maps, uh, s satellite images, drones flying maybe around, not right now, but in the future, part of the photogrammetry, getting a lot of the data, building the 3D as da databases, and then putting it all together, maybe using the maps, to be gentle. <laughs> or maybe, get, again, using AI to help us to do that, to look at the examples of the world. And this is a simple example that I was working on. This is just, you, you're just creating variations of the textures. You give it one image and then you can generate a different set of uh, images that kind of, by example, there is, there is no other input and creates a new textures. Uh, it's a, based on VGG, actually. So are uh, these widths, so all of these are AI generated? Yes. Okay. Uh, the funny thing was that uh, uh, that uh, the original image, it's not here, I think. Yeah. Or is it? Uh, no, I don't think the original image is here, but the original Im image had the uh, watermarks. Ah. And uh, in the generated images, there are no <laughs> watermarks. That's interesting. <laughs> they just... Uh, they, they fall out of the they machine no, sees that they don't belong here. So I think there is a starter way there right here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a simple example of the generative model. The, you can find more examples of the generative model. It's kind of not really well developed yet, but we, I think we can be, we will be able to uh, use generative models not just to generate textures. Textures is a kind of simpler case, but I'm gently pressing it, for, but actually trying to create worlds, basically look at the distribution of the objects in the real world. Maybe take the, basically taking the photos and creating scenes from example, using those asset databases that we are building, people are building, and then look at the pictures, okay, I see the same, the same what the car is doing, like I see that there's this, this and this object in the photo, so I can find them on us in the asset database now, and I could put them so they fit approximately, and that way, like basically reverse creation of the world. Use the same algorithms that we use to in the cars to see things, in order to create worlds and then to train them again, and to use those networks to improve. So it's like a loop, constantly improving. So. A friend of mine uh, was saying, so how it's not just in the, 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 you know, the... the worse and worse, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you humans have to do manual labor somewhere in this loop. We always will have to put manual labor to spin that wheel in order to get it better, not worse and worse. Uh, so it's a very ugly slide. There is a lot of ideas. It can be basically guns and CNNs can be used. I, I would just skip a little bit. And another as aspect is, of course, using not just to train AI vision, but actually to test cars, right? So it's more maybe more self-evident thing is uh, integrating ROS, uh, robot, uh, robotic operating system, just the SOC integrated it right now, and you can stream uh, AIs from, like, so, so it would be a vehicle that you would stream yeah. from? Like yes. a, like a self-driving car, just yeah. constantly streaming and retraining? Yeah. Okay. Or testing it more, like maybe not okay. retraining, but testing if it can, what, what it's doing. And so it's going to be a sad time for QA testers at Unity, right? <laughs> Robots replacing them, <laughs> running around streets. I've heard what company is working on that, actually. 
on, on, on using machine learning for the test. That's first, it's a game development company. And they, one of the applications for the reinforcement learning they're working, they don't think that we'll, they will be able to uh, make an AI so good that the players would play it, but the first application for it is actually to replace QA, to make a reinforcement learning which smart enough just to explore around and try the games. Yeah. And yeah, that are analogous to the, analogously to the robotic ROS, there is integration like we just shipped the MLA agents, it's an integration with TensorFlow essentially. It's again socket, just a socket thingy, which allows uh, agents, be, like AI being written in Python and TensorFlow and streaming da data back and forth getting the, basically the images or something, some data back into TensorFlow doing the simulations, like, uh, doing the AI on that again and having this cooperability. So, so is, then, is this done to be able to switch out the frameworks or? No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So basically I'm trying to say that the, this, this interesting loop between how AI looks at the world, creates a model in the head, and that model can be used to create virtual worlds, which can then be used to render things and train AI. And yeah, then AI gets better and the loop continues, hopefully. And that's it. Thank you. Do you have questions, I guess? Yep, yeah. questions. Where will Skynet will come? What, the, so for the recording, the question is, when will Skynet will come? I, I think that's the question to Electronic Arts, maybe, <laughs> or Google, not. We are nice guys. We don't, I don't know. <laughs> here, Willis, 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 here we go. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so when you are rendering uh, the world, uh, do you apply some modifications like uh, rain, uh, snow uh, in the streets, and uh, like sh sunshine? Uh, that's, I guess, easy to apply, right? Yes, that's, that's easy, uh, relatively easy, but that's been done many times in games. So we're kind of experimenting, and they, one of the ideas is to uh, understand, and w again, we're working with this, uh, the, the university in Barcelona that's actually they are more interested in that is to figure out uh, what affects the quality of the AI being trained is it like lighting which affects it more is it the weather conditions basically what textures what 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 makes it to train better well, sunshine. sunshine is fatal like in uh, autonomous driving as we know mm. So, so uh, it is, yeah, the, the problem with sensors, but I guess there's different combinations, like you know, LIDARs as well. So. so I guess my question is, in, in, if you do these things in, in real time, do you use pre-baked lighting at all? Does it all have to be like dynamic, which puts a lot of load on the system, I guess. Yeah. So yes, right now, basically, we don't either don't use any pre-baked lighting. We are thinking to use the pre-baked lighting for that uh, small uh, intersection because it's, it's just that part of the world, so for that it can be used uh, pre-baking. In other scenes that I showed, we don't use any lighting. It's, sometimes it's good enough, actually, uh, because, again, the bounces of the light, they might be on the street. They are not that important. The shadows is important, but, like, the bouncing from the from the wall and to the ground might not be that important. We don't know, but so far we just keep it. Uh, again, for the octane, for the ray tracers, that's a real time close to real-time solution, which, give, which can give you a not baked uh, lighting, global illumination lighting. So, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation again. Thanks for the presentation again. And uh, you mentioned that, uh, actually the other speaker mentioned that around 50% of brain is for doing something with vision. Now I'm wondering uh, for the automotive industry, I guess something would be also interesting is to pay attention to uh, my 
question is, are you also working on rendering sound and maybe even other senses, like it's, geometers it's, and smells and everything? It, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. I, I, I haven't thought about that. <laughs> no one discussed that part, at least. We, we think uh, we are interested in simulating other sensors, like li LIDAR, li LIDARs, the, the spinning uh, lasers. So it's a laser emitting radar, so it's basically a laser beam scanning the distance to objects spinning around. So, so that's as, as far as, I guess we are too much rendering oriented of us, so mm. haven't thought about that. It's quite interesting, actually. I don't know if CAR is doing anything with the sound. It sounds actually quite important when you mention it, but we, we haven't thought, I haven't thought. Right. But, but from my experience in VR, for example, sound is actually much harder than, than visual stuff because if you think about different frequencies, they bounce off differently from different objects and they have absorption. So it's in, sim in terms of simulation, it's much more labor intensive. Any, so any questions for the speaker? One at the back. Any more questions at the back so I can just send off the mic once? <laughs> um, can, you, can you lift it up to people there? I just wanted to ask, uh, do you use uh, real world maps for generating video, you know, for your training? Or you just, uh, just, I don't know. So at, at Unity, we don't use, our partners use, but I don't really know what, I know that uh, our partners are using uh, maps, but because of the costs, and we, 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 we are not, ourselves, we don't do that. But definitely, it's, I mean, it's an important part for the world building. The maps is definitely an important uh, component. Uh, here, taking from, the, uh, taking from the, what the, he was saying about sound, maybe a question in general. Is there like anyone else working with sound around, like synthesis of uh, rendering of sound, AI, or something? Uh, sorry, could you, could you repeat the question? If there's, if there's someone around, I mean, not necessarily a question to you, but... In general, if there's like someone working in synthesis and rendering of sound, no, I, I mean, or sound I, analysis or anything. Yeah, that's what I said. I uh, in 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 particularly in terms of AI for the machine for the cars. No, I don't know anyone. For the games, we have certain uh, simulations. Like there are a couple of solutions for the, uh, but they usually are more like a baked solutions. That that there is a sim, some pre predefined areas kind of that are pre-simulated pre uh, and usually in the game engines or uh, you travel between those pre-calculated pre areas how the sound, like they know the, the volume of the, of the room around you kind of. That's, that's a normal solution for the games. Uh, yeah. I, I guess there's not that many people around in the community working with sounds, but I think that point is very interesting. Uh, it's called HRFT Transform. You can look it up. You probably know about it. Is there any more questions at the back here while I'm here? Here we go. First of all, to you guys there, I know the company in Israel which is working with sound, kind of using the same ultrasound uh, sensing for self-driving cars to get data from that to analyze that. And then the question for you, um, if you have any particular challenges uh, while dealing with this kind of applications for self-driving and navigation, what is the most difficult or challenging part to deal with while using these kind of applications? Well, it's full of challenges at the moment, to be, to be honest. As, as a, probably one of the, the challenge that we are kind of, okay, the, the, probably the two, two challenges that come up to my, to my mind. One is what I mentioned is creating those worlds, virtual worlds, basically. That's a big, big challenge for us. How to, how to get this data, how to put it together so, it's, it, so it doesn't cost millions of millions. It, 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 that's probably one of the big, and then being able to render that that's a much smaller kind of challenge. The biggest challenge is getting the data together. And, and while doing that as well, figuring out what is important and what is not important, because we cannot really go and simu like simulate and scan every thing exactly, right? No, we could, but it's just an um, infinite amount of time. So it's, while doing that, the challenge is to figure out what is important as soon as, 
like as quickly as possible so we didn't, don't waste too much time on scanning or, or, or getting the data that is not necessary for, for cars per se. Uh, an another challenge, it's more kind of, it's not really connected with cars, but since I'm kind of working with that, I would mention it. So it's actually running neural networks on different platforms uh, on, uh, as efficiently as possible. Like if you take TensorFlow, uh, for instance, if you start, like it's, okay, let's put it with this way. AI today, uh, application of AI is so dominated by NVIDIA. Uh, for us as a company that is interested in the cross-platform to be able to run on different platforms, both uh, in terms of Mac, Windows, and, uh, uh, and in terms of small devices that are going to uh, be used in the cars as well, to, as a brain for the car. Uh, for us, it's a big challenge. How do we make sure that it's not only just NVIDIA, but that neural networks can be executed on not just CUDA-enabled GPUs, but take advantage of different GPUs, take advantage of special DSPs and whatnot, what, what, what hardware vendors are providing. I, <clears throat> as physicist, I did lots of modeling, like the first part of your graph. So I know that every time you do modeling simulation, you have kind of error all the time from the real world. So let's say your error is left in the rendering and when you teach your AI to model the world with that already error. So how you overcome that problem or do you have it? Uh, I've, the, the current kind of idea is to mix the data, to take the real world data uh, with from, the, from real cameras, do the mano, uh, kind of do mano labeling on it and just mix it together. Train on, uh, try to train on the, yeah, basically mix the two data sets. That's the idea of real world and synthetic. I don't think we ever will go for 100% synthetic. I think it will be always mixture. Just to add on that, I think the Apple article you featured is a very fascinating one to read. It's quite an easy read and they talk about all these challenges they, mm. they came up with, the synthetic yes, and real world data. So who else has a question? I saw some hands. Um, Anyone here? Anyone I'm missing? Is, if that's it, then uh, let's give a round of applause for our speaker. Uh, yeah, I just really want to thank for this great talk. And without further ado, we're going to have a third presentation after a short break. So
Uh, oops. We're about to start, so everyone who's out there, you can sort of come over for a talk. You, you feel free to uh, grab some drinks and... Uh, okay. Mm. Let's give it a few minutes. There, there are plenty of the seats around here, so feel free to go up. Okay, so we're... we're before we start, I just want to introduce our uh, third speaker, third and final speaker. And after his talk, we're going to have some answers through the last week, month's quiz and some news about the next meetup. So don't run away uh, just yet. Um, so the next speaker uh, is from a very sort of engineering and science-oriented company that gave you the pizzas that you all enjoyed vigorously, as I just saw. <laughs> So th thanks for that. And um, they've been starting and working with neural networks for quite a while now. I think it was, what, 1990? No, but as a company, Neurotechnologies, 1994, right? Something like that. Way, way, before, um, and it, it, way before it was cool, <laughs> basically that. So yeah, so before fear to do. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna let the speaker continue by himself and uh, let's enjoy the talk. Thanks. Hello, let me adjust my voice. <clears throat> so I'm Anders uh, from Neurotechnology, and uh, today we are going to talk about CNNs, convolutional neural networks or convnets. So in the uh, first two presentations, your uh, first presenter, for example, showed you inception network. You remember this big network where he showed that you only need to train that only rot, uh, red dot, yeah? So, uh, this talk, I will understand what other colors in this network means and uh, how you can tweak them, okay? Um, I'm going to give you a outline about my talk. So, um, at first, i uh, going to explain what uh, convolutional neural networks consist of. And after that, I will present uh, uh, popular architectures, uh, which like uh, exists in, in uh, today's deep learning frameworks as pre-trained networks. So you can uh, take them, modify them, or just take ideas on which they were built on. So as, as you heard in previous talks, uh, the keyword ImageNet, yeah? So ImageNet is like uh, Olympics. Of, of convolutional neural networks. Uh, so scientists tries to create uh, the better networks uh, and uh, to get uh, the better accuracy and to refine the ideas. So each year, uh, this competition or, or winner of this competition uh, is like inspiration for the advance of convolutional neural networks. So, uh, uh, and before we start, let me ask you, how much of you have tried to train convolutional neural network? Oh my. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, it's not a rocket science. Basically, you need only to know the multiplication to train a neural network, yeah? So I hope that uh, you will get an idea how this is, works, okay? So let's move on. Um, yeah. I imagine that you, uh, when you're thinking about a uh, uh, neural network, it's a, a pile of, of some magical bricks, which somehow uh, takes image and produce some, some, some number vector, which are like a uh, label of, of, a, of a class, yeah? And uh, I hope that after this talk, you, you will know, you will uh, get an idea what these bricks are, and uh, that there are a lot of bricks in, in, in uh, CNN training. Okay, so 
let me tell you what uh, convolution is, yeah? Before we start, because it's uh, essentially convolution of neural networks consists of mainly three bricks, yeah? One brick is convolution, another brick is fully connected layer, and the third brick is uh, uh, max pooling layer. So, uh, what convolutional uh, layer is essentially we have. Uh, why there is not working? Uh, okay. Okay, it's not working. So we have the, the filter, the matrix. It has a spatial dimension versus file. Uh, it's not pointing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, uh, okay. So, and uh, it's essentially a filter which you apply to an input image. Yeah? We have a 32 by 32 uh, image, and we take this filter and do a multiplication with the input image. And, you would, and after multiplication and summation, you get uh, one response, one number. Essentially, this operation is called convolution. So it's a dot product, yeah? Uh, and this is how it works, yeah? We take this matrix and slide in every position in spatial dimensions of an input image, yeah? And as you see, this is color image because it has uh, three depth dimensions, yeah? For example, red, green, blue. And uh, our filter also has a depth dimension, yeah? So convolutional filter not only, owes, not, not only goes uh, through spatial dimensions, but all, all, also it applies convolution to whole depth of an input image, yeah? And uh, mathematically, it's written as a dot product plus bias, yeah? Okay, let's move on. And if we apply this dot product at every available location, we get what it's called, uh, we get a response, which is technically called activation map. Essentially, it's a response of, of this matrix multiplication in every input image uh, with one uh, convolutional kernel. This matrix is called kernel or filter, uh, so that's that. Uh, one thing I want that you uh, to notice that input image was 32 by 32. After uh, operation, we somehow reduced the input dimensions. The activation map has a uh, few spatial dimensions, and this is due to uh, this op con how convolutional operation works. So uh, essentially, we need to, if we want to, to, to keep uh, activation map as same as in, in input map, we need to pad it. For example, there is, exam there is a, a GIF which uh, we are taking three by three convolution, applying to four by four input, and if we do not have any uh, padding, as it's called, we get reduced output dimensions, yeah? But if we use zero padding, or we pad input image with zeros, we get uh, activation map is, uh, has same spatial dimensions as our input image, okay? And another uh, parameter, it's called stride, yeah? So um, here, see that we are sliding a convolutional kernel by one pixel, from, from left to right, from top to down by one pixel, yeah? And for example, if we slide this kernel, as, as, men, as, as, as you see in uh, this example, we get reduction of spatial dimensions. We slide by two pixels. So essentially, we are reducing input image uh, by, by some amount of, of, of pixels, yeah? So, so far, so good. Are you following me? Okay, let's move on. So if we have not one filter, or in this example six, 
we get six different activation maps, yeah? Essentially, this output of convolutional layer will be input to another convolutional layer. But before that, we had three, dimension three in a depth, and after our first layer, we have uh, reduced spatial dimensions. We can fix that, yeah? And also we have increased depth dimension, yeah? For example, if we uh, apply 100 filters, we will get 100 activation maps. And this would be a new input image. Got? Okay. Uh, and that's all a convolutional layer is doing. Taking dot product uh, with kernels, combining these activation maps, and passing to another layer. So, uh, and I wanted to show you a special case uh, because in a previous example, we had a kernel with a dimension like three by three, uh, five by five, seven by seven, uh, why not? And uh, there is a special case where we use uh, one by one dimension. Essentially, uh, what we are doing, we are reducing input volume. We have an image, yeah, 56 by, fix, uh, uh, 56, by 56 and depth of 64. And if we apply 32 one by one convolutions, essentially, we will get 32 output activation maps. And uh, this uh, idea at first was presented in a, in a paper, uh, Network in Network, it's called, I think. And it's essential idea on which uh, modern computer vision architectures are based on. Because it lets you to keep track of uh, parameters of neural network. If you would not have this uh, idea, uh, your networks would be very huge, and you, for example, could not uh, run it on your home GPU. You need some 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 kind of cluster. Yeah. So you saw this slide before, yeah. So essentially, these filters initially are initialized as a random numbers. Yeah, from some distribution. It may be Gaussian distribution, it uniform Gaussian, a normal Gaussian, or some, some small random numbers, let's call it that, yeah? And after we feed enough data and network is, is, learns something from this data, for example, to classify cats versus dogs or one person from another, uh, it establishes some, some, kind of, some kind of hierarchy. Uh, in the first layer, you will see in the top, in the top corner, there are example filters, and, uh, and, and this image is a patches of image which maximizes activation of this, these visors. In the first uh, layer of convolutional neural network, essentially we have uh, low-level filters, as in the computer vision, edge detectors, oriented filters, and so on, as you see that we have three oriented filters, some color filters, and as we move on uh, in a network, yeah, for example, in a second layer, second layer takes a lot of, uh, second layer tries to combine activations from the low level features to some meaningful concepts. And as you move on, as you move to, in a depth direction of a convolutional layer, these filter, uh, these uh, convolutional uh, layers learn more complex abstract concepts about the input, how to combine different parts of input, yeah? And uh, briefly, I need to go back uh, in the first uh, slide, why this is not working. Yeah, uh, one thing I want to, uh, to point out what I forgot, uh, as, as you see, the, that the same kernel is, or the same filter is to a small patch of image. Essentially, we are trying to find 
for example, corner or some 35 degree line or whatever. And uh, this, that if we have a small filter and apply it every direction, the filter is only one, yeah? And if, for example, we, tr we tried to have some huge, huge filter, which applied to every, every pixel, it would be very, very inefficient. It can be, po it can be possible, but it's very computationally, computationally inefficient. So essentially, we are like enforcing network to learn. For example, you see only a small patch here, you see a small patch here, and try to grasp what that means. Because network, this small kernel, does not see whole image, yeah? Only later layers can combine the responses of, of this layer and try to, to grasp what, what network is seeing. Okay, I, I, think, I, thought, I think you got the idea. Okay, let's move on. Oh, there is example how it looks like. We, yeah, we have some oriented filter, it moves very quickly, yeah? One green and one red. And it produces two activation maps. And they are different. And these filters are learned from some random numbers to like edge detectors. Okay? So essentially, this is the representation what the convolutional layer, layer is doing. Okay, fully connected layer. That is simple, yeah? You, you have a neuron which connects to every input pixel or, or, or input feature vector, yeah? And essentially what uh, fully connected layer uh, does, it's, it tries to aggregate information from a whole region, yeah? Convolutional layer takes patches, uh, fully connected layer takes whole concept and tries to, to, to get a, what, what you want uh, from, from that. And essentially you can uh, express fully connected layer as a convolutional layer by some clever uh, transpositions. We can skip that part. And the last thing, uh, our last brick of our convolutional layer is uh, pooling layers. Essentially what they are doing, as you see, we have filter, two by two filter, and when it slides, it takes maximum uh, value. For example, if I have max filter, it takes that number, that number, that number, and that number. So uh, what does this pooling layer does? It uh, reduces spatial dimension yeah, of an input volume. Also, it filters out uh, um, insignificant features. For example, if I get strong activation uh, or some filter detected corner, uh, and I want like to pass that information to a network, the, the best would be that the, my activation where the corner is would be the highest. So if there would be the highest activation, the corner information will be passed to the next layer. Otherwise, it will be skipped. Yeah? So we can apply a maximum operation or average operation. Uh, it, it's called uh, average pooling. And we can, for example, use some other kind of filter. If we use two by two and with try two, we get like four times the spatial dimension reduction. And that's it. That's all the magic in convolutional neural network. <laughs> so uh, uh, now, essentially, convolutional neural network is convolutional layer, nonlinearity layer. So we, for example, want somehow to transform the output of each layer. Yeah, and uh, we can insert. Uh, rectified uh, linear unit or some max out uh, uh, max pool operation. Essentially, it's uh, the stack, CNN is a stack of these three activations. And the magic happens 
in a way, you need to think, how do I need to stack these operations that I get a meaningful result? Yeah? Because there are meaningful ways to stack these operations and uh, not so good way. Yeah? For example, if I stack three times max pool operation, I, I, I greatly, greatly reduce the image. And for example, for network, it would be very, very hard to learn because it sees, for example, two by two pixels from our original image. So uh, motivation for this talk is uh, that you can uh, get an idea what is like an appropriate or uh, time-tested ways to combine these operations together. Uh, and as, as it says, devil lies in the details. <laughs> uh, I presented the, in a high level these, these three operations. Okay, what the hell? Okay, so uh, essentially every layer has some metaparameters which you need to choose when you are designing your, net, your neural network. So we have receptive field sites. It's essentially the metric size f uh, which, uh, which we use to filter the input image, yeah? So how many filters we're gonna use? Uh, if we use tried, if we use padding, uh, from what initial distribution we are going to initialize our filters? For pooling layer, uh, also regularization, but I did not add that. Uh, for pooling layers, receptive field size, and uh, which pooling I'm gonna do, max pooling or average pooling. And uh, which of transformation of activations I'm going to do, ReLU, Leaky ReLU, max out, PRLU, LU, SLU, and there are a uh, few more of them. Uh, default choice is ReLU. Essentially, this function is very simple. If my if activation I'm getting is below zero, I pass zero. If it's above zero, I pass, I pass it uh, what it is, for example. It zero, maximum value of zero, or the, 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 the variable. And I'm not gonna mention about that. If you are interested, interested in them, you can read about them, okay? And the biggest question is how to arrange these operations, as I was mentioning earlier, yeah? So let's look at, let's look at, at, at in a ways, how to, how to create these CNNs. Uh, and essentially, why we do, do you do need to, to pay attention to, to these uh, ImageNet uh, tested networks because for example as, as mentioned in, in previous in, in the first talk you can for example take them and retrain to your to your data set you can for example take ideas from them uh, and for example you can do uh, not only classification but as we saw in the in second talk uh, semantic segmentation or detection of cars and you take existing neural network and plug in to a detection algorithm or segmentation algorithm and whatever. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so essentially try not, not to reinvent the wheel, yeah? Okay, so VGGNet, it's very simple, it's very elegant uh, but it's heavy. <laughs> Essentially, what we are doing, yeah, we need to look at the column D, yeah. It's, it's called VGG16 and, uh, and call, or VGG19. The, the, it's, uh, the, the architecture is pr uh, product of Oxford University, and uh, it's very simple. We take two convolutional layers, uh, take input, two convolutional layers, max pool, convolutional, two convolutional layers, max pool, convolutional layers, max pool. And that's all. That's all. And two fully connected layers, 
and and uh, this is prediction layer of, of, of ImageNet, yeah? And uh, if you, for example, have uh, your own problem, you can adapt this, this pattern of architect architecture pattern to your own needs. For example, you can remove this part, yeah? Or remove these two parts, and why not, yeah? So it's very simple and uh, very elegant, yeah? And uh, the contribution of, of this architecture was, before that, people tried different filter sizes, like 11 by 11, 7 by 7. And these people said, you don't need that. Use 3 by 3, and you're good. So that's it. And now people default, the, like the default choice is 3 by 3 convolution. So uh, also, they said, if you reduce spatial dimension, with max pool, increase uh, filter count in the next layer. As you see, for example, we have uh, in the COM3, yeah, 64 filters. After max pool, we have double of that, 128. And after every max pool, we double the number of filters. So essentially, if you're reducing spatial size, create more, more, more filters to capture concept in this reduced, reduced input volume, yeah? And uh, it's like four years old, I think, uh, this architecture, but it's still very good. It's still widely used in detection, in, uh, in Kaggle. Uh, I think s there was like sea lions counting competition and they used VGG to count sea lions and they won. Uh, so yeah. A downsize is that it's a very heavy. So, and, and the most, most parameters comes from these two heavy fully connected layers. So if you remove them, it's, it, it gets lighter. Okay, so that is VGGNet. Now you know it. Okay. Uh, inception. I merged two networks. There is Google, Net, uh, Google Lenet, which is called like Inception uh, version one, and uh, there is Inception version three. But the main contribution of this, these guys from, from, from Google was that, as you saw previous, we have sequential operation. Take input image, take convolution layer, apply it, pass uh, the output to another convolution layer, apply it to another, to another, one sequence. And guys from Google thought, hmm, what do we do? Huh, what convolution uh, to apply, three by three or five by five? Or maybe we need to do max pooling, hmm, or maybe one by one convolution. Why do not apply them all and let the network learn which one is better? So they created, it's called tower, tower architecture. This is inception model. And uh, you code this model and stack a lot of them <laughs> together. So, and you see that they added these one by one convolutions uh, before more computationally intensive three by three and five by five. Uh, and they added that, them because we are in the top, in the top, we are doing merging of activation maps, yeah? And when we are merging, our depth of activations are increasing, yeah? It's multiplicative, uh, multiplicative increase. So if we are not gonna do anything about that, uh, after few repetition of this block, we'll, we, we will have a lot of parameters in network and we would, we would not be able to, to train it. So essentially, when a huge input is coming, we compress it to more man manageable size. And uh, also they introduced, uh, it's called asymmetric filters. Essentially, three by three fil uh, filtering is, uh, can be expressed as combination of one by three and as two layers of convolution with the filters one by three and three by one. 
essentially. And it is cheaper computationally. So uh, that's that. So inception, in, in VGG we have 16 layers, yeah? And uh, inception, version one, we have 28 layers. In inception version three, we have 100 layers. And that is, this block is that, that thing here, yeah? So they just stacked the blocks. They also added the, the pooling, pooling block. So now you know how this dragon is combined. Okay, so we have neural network which consists of 100 layers. How can we do better? Hmm? We need to go, someone need to, need to say, we need more layers. <laughs> okay, so next, Microsoft guys had a wonderful idea. Hmm, this Google Inception module is, is uh, quite complicated. Let's think something more simple, yeah? Because who gonna code that thing, yeah? And who gonna train that monster? So essentially, they got an idea. What if we apply two convolutions, get result, and sum it with the input of this convolution? It's called a ResNet block, yeah? And what happens if we stack this block together? We get ResNet or residual network. And uh, this hack, it's called the uh, skip connection. It essentially enables you to train very deep networks. For example, if you, uh, if you just stack convolutional layers uh, at, a some, at, a some, at a some moment, uh, your, tra your, your network will, will start to perform way worse. And if we if you add this skip connection, you're good to go. So they thought about uh, these blocks. This is for uh, networks like 50 layers deep, and this block is for all else, like for one ResNet 100, ResNet 150, or ResNet 100, uh, ResNet 200, and so on. So essentially what they are doing, they are compressing Input is uh, 25, 6 uh, dimensions, yeah? We have image which has 20, 256 channels, yeah? We compress it to, to, to have 64 channels, then apply uh, costly 3x3 three three convolution and expand, uh, make a projection to the higher uh, dimension. And uh, that's it. It's, it's very simple, it's very elegant, and it works very, very well. So, for example, you can take pre-trained ResNet and apply to your, to your, uh, to your task of a choice. Because when, when they trained uh, this network on uh, ImageNet, they won all three competitions. There is classification competition, there is localization competition, and there is uh, detection competition. So, this network was, is, is quite good and the design is very elegant, yeah? So now you can see how, how this network looks like, yeah? It's, on, it's very small, only 33 layers. <laughs> and, uh, and this ResNet thing is very popular now. There are uh, a lot of modifications and uh, a lot of inspiration uh, of, of a kind, how can we modify these, these building blocks. Uh, what happens, for example, if we add skip connection to every layer? What happens if we increase the size of layer? What happens if we change uh, uh, these convolutions to something different? So, uh, and what happens if we mix this 
building block. Where is uh, this one? <laughs> and if you mix it, you get uh, Inception v version 4. And I'm not going to put it on a slide. <laughs> it's be overkill. You can check the paper, Google Inception version 4. It's, it's very accurate, yeah? Yeah, I can I can I can say you. You uh, do you know gradient descent? Yeah. So if you have gradient of of a, of a network, yeah, and if you have summing operation, your gradient do not need to pass to from uh, when you back do when you are doing back propagation, you need to pass to back to from these from these layers. Yeah. Essentially, you can skip them. You can because it's some some operation. You can go this in, in this in this in this way, and can skip it. So gradient signal from a, uh, from a classification layer, yeah, from softmax, can travel bigger distances. That's essentially. It, it's a problem uh, about gradient diminishing. If you Google it, for example, uh, yeah. If, if that, th this, you can combat this problem in different ways. For example, better initialization, uh, but essentially this idea helped to, to do that. And uh, before, before this idea, you could not train the network. For example, these guys trained the network with, uh, I think, 1,600 1, layers to, to classify some images. So, yeah, that's that. Try it without the skip connection and it will not work. Uh, okay, so there are some uh, variants of, of these uh, ResNets. I just put them on a the slide, but not gonna talk about them. Basically, uh, wide ResNet, you increase the size. Uh, dense net just modifies skip connection. If you're interested, you can, for example, uh, Look at that. Look at at, uh, at them in in the Google, and uh, some some frameworks has uh, pre-trained weights. For example, this one got uh, last year got uh, best paper reward from ECML. So yeah, and uh, Keras has that one implemented. So for you can you can take these architectures uh, as a pre-trained networks. Uh, okay, and this one is a fresh, fresh one. It's a squeeze excitation network. It's a winner of this year ImageNet. And they got a very brilliant idea. Uh, I liked it a lot. So essentially, um, we have activation, yeah? Output from convolution. It has a lot of feature maps. And at, for example, Inception tried to capture different spatial responses. When you apply different size filters, you try to, to capture different spatial responses from, from an input image. And these guys thought, hmm, what happens if we try to discriminate or activate uh, some channels because you can slice in a, in a, in a, in a one, uh, one filter provides one activation, yeah? So some activations are bad, some are good. If we can learn to discriminate bad and to excitate good, we will get a better performance, yeah? And uh, that is that, what you're doing. They just apply average pooling, so from this huge volume, they get a one by one vector of, essentially it's a score for each activation map. And what they want to do, want to learn to weight these activation maps. So they are doing, they take average pooling, 
uh, it's cool. and uh, they apply two fully connected layers, two, two very small fully connected layers, uh, because they also want to capture uh, how it's called in English interaction between different channels. For example, if uh, one channel is irrelevant, it, I think it's irrelevant, but actually when combined with another, it produces good activation, maybe I should not uh, throw out that, yeah? So essentially, we need to model feature uh, as, as if, if you've done some, uh, I don't know, uh, classification of, of table data feature interaction, yeah? So we have two fully connected layers, and in the end, we have gating mechanism. Essentially, it's a sigmoid transformation. You get zero if, uh, if activation is uh, negative, you get one if activation is positive. So uh, if we multiply activation by zero, it will be zero, and we discriminate it very hardly. So that's the idea of this. You add these two networks, and you get this squeeze and excitation. And that you can add this construct to these previous architectures. You take ResNet block, it produces output, and you add this tiny network, which scores the output. That's it. That's the idea. So they are like improving. <laughs> Actually, they improved the uh, ResNet results, uh, Inception results, uh, uh, ResNet XT results. Uh, every network they tried in the paper on this ImageNet competition, they improved after they add these two tiny fully connected layers. So, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I just told that. And uh, last, I want to show like complexity chart of, of these networks, yeah? These are early layers, so uh, you see VGG16, it's a, this, it's a performance on, uh, um, on ImageNet when you only give single crop of an image. You, you, you get one only single crop of an image, and uh, you get the accuracy, yeah? So Inception V4 is uh, the most accurate, uh, now it's not most accurate, yeah. <laughs> See, yeah, it is, is, but, this paper, uh, when this paper was written, Inception version 4 was most accurate, yeah? Yeah, so, um, and you can see in this chart, the bubble is a param parameter count, uh, and uh, we have operations, and we have the accuracy. So, uh, for example, if you have a slow GPU card, yeah, uh, with a small RAM size, you need, for example, train Google Lanet or Inception version 1 or some tiny ResNet 18. And if you have a bigger uh, pool of resources, you can, for example, train Inception V4. Yeah? Or VGG. So uh, that is the end of my, of my talk, and thank you. Wow, that was really, really interesting and, and really quite complex. Does it, are there any questions from the audience? There you go. Um. Could you talk more about the, like, the inception concatenating of uh, different filters? Because as I understand, like, if you apply uh, three par parallel like, uh, filters for the same image that have different dimensions, yeah. the uh, activation maps have like, different dimensions. Yeah, yeah. So Oh, they, they, use, they, they use padding. Yeah, they use padding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, can, I can go back. Uh, yeah, yeah, but let me go back. Uh, where is that? Yeah. So, for example, uh, you just, it's over-engineered approach. Yeah. They, if you, for example, look at Inception version 4, it's, it's a nightmare. 
uh, because, <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, you just, uh, if you do uh, uh, half padding, as I shown in the slide, you get the same input, as, uh, same activation output as input, yeah? So if you pad correctly, you will get the same size, size uh, activation as your input. And when you concatenate them, you only increase the channel dimension, yeah? And that's, that's it. Cool, Basically. any more questions? There you go. Um, yes, hello. I, I was just thinking if there's been any work in trying to determine automatically the, the, the optimal CNN structure yes, yes, and there the parameters is that, yes, with there heuristics is. like genetic programming or something with like that. With reinforcement like. learning. There is, there is a papers, uh, but uh, for, for mere mortals, it's impossible to do these kinds of experiments. I think Google does done the, some experiment. They trained like for two weeks on, on 150 GPUs, so it's kind of not realistic for mere mortals to, to, to do that approach. But essentially, they, what the result of a paper was, uh, we have the CIFAR 10 data set. It's very simple, 32 by 32 images of 10 classes, yeah? Uh, it's a, like, I don't know if you know, MNIST data set. It's, it's a very simple data set, it's like a benchmark. Uh, standard benchmark of, of, of uh, computer vision uh, networks, yeah? So basically they trained, uh, added some constraints, they trained uh, the network to choose the topology, uh, a network chose something like that, but way, 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 way more towers. Uh, and, and the result was that, for example, asymmetric filters uh, and uh, interconnection because now you see a tower goes to the top, yeah? And after this reinforcement learning, the, for example, this connects to that, that connects to that, and so on and so too. So, but you, if, if you uh, search ArcSile uh, of, of architecture, or keywords like CNN architectures, reinforcement learning, you will get the paper and you can read it. Yeah, so there were uh, up to 15 models uh, in the last slide. Uh, is there any difference from the end, end user or use case perspective which one we should use and for what purposes? Uh, we should apply this ENET or the last version of this interception? Yeah, uh, some, for example, yeah, let's, let's go to the end. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, usually, uh, like which G16, yeah, it's the simplest. Uh, and it's widely available. For example, if I don't know if you use TensorFlow, PyTorch, or whatever framework, it's already built uh, with pre-trained weights, yeah? For example, for Inception version 4, I think there is no official pre-trained weights. So Google does not release the, the, the official version of pre-trained weights, yeah? Uh, so you... You, you may try to train on, on ImageNet, this, this network, yeah? But usually you just, uh, yeah, this uh, approach be between, uh, like trade-off between accuracy and, uh, and, and the parameter count, yeah? But usually when we are talking about this, this uh, uh, I, I did not add chart, but it's like we surpassed human performance. On, on ImageNet. So now, uh, when, when we look at ImageNet data, we see that, for example, some uh, images are mislabeled. Yeah, there are errors in, in labeling. So what a network are trying, it's trying to, it, it, it can predict the class correctly, but it need to predict it incorrectly to get a better score in ImageNet. Okay, so uh, that is that. So you get the diminishing return of accuracy, yeah. After some point, uh, the increase in accuracy will, for example, you, you get 1% increase in accuracy, but you, for example, has complexity of inception ver version 4. And if you, as a developer, 
try, uh, you need to, to code this network, you will think, no, I'm not going to do that. You, cho you choose the uh, VGG16 because it's very elegant, very simple to code, and you roll with this choice. So uh, uh, it's practical. W uh, what's, for example, if like with Inception, uh, if it's ready available, uh, pr uh, official model, yeah, you can take that. It's, it's, it's very good, yeah? It's very good. And you just need to add data, get results, as, as, a, as the first speaker told us about. So, but for example, if you don't want to, to work with TensorFlow or want to write your own convolutional network inspired by these ideas, then you are on your own. Great. Any more questions? Um, no? Okay, let's give it a round of applause to the speaker again. Thank you. No, no, that was great. So before you all go, I just quickly want um, to come back to the quiz answers of the last month's quiz. So, um, so the quiz answers to the, to, the, to the birds and to the quiz. So anyway, who saw this? Did anyone look? I'll stop doing this if nobody looks at them. Because, <laughs> okay, two people saw this. So, so who knows what this is? This, is, this was the header of the event, an image representing a paper, the neural network paper. No? Here we go. So <laughs> you kind of overran this, so you, I guess you're, you'll beat this. Hmm. I was about to make a competition and ask everyone <laughs> who's going to answer first. So I guess you won and disqualified yourself at the same time, so you can collect a prize later. <laughs> Okay, so the so it's it's one of the pace, papers I wanted to highlight this time. So all words are created by text. So you put some text into a neural network, the text on the top, and then in different networks, spit us out um, images of these birds. You can go into this paper, which I'm going to put the link on on the cover page, and read more about this. But this is quite fascinating because you can supply a network with text, and after doing some complex things with it. It gives you an image, which more and more looks like a real image of a real thing, or the thing is trying to generate. So in this paper, they, they show you an example of birds and flowers, and it's still in limited resolution. But I guess one day you'll be able to make some more images of yourself without taking images of yourself. So <laughs> this is just the thing to think about <laughs> while you go. And um, just a quick info before you all go about the next meetup. So as you asked last time, we'll try to do this every month. So I haven't got the specific date for the next meetup. It's going to be somewhere around the end of November on Thursday, possibly, and possibly here. I'll let you all know in the comments of this event and also in the AI Lithuania group, which I suggest you all subscribe to for the local news. And uh, just to go back to this, this was the cryptic message from the very last slide from the last event, and it described a few of the speakers, and a few of the speakers couldn't make it, so these are the answers. <laughs> And you can find the speakers and ask them why. Why? Why Daniel is somebody who knows a lot about AI pigeons? <laughs> and why Ronald is somebody who lets AI to play and make games? And he might talk about that. And just, um, they were real pigeons. Well, <laughs> well, now you can ask him why. Um, so for the next meetup, we're going to have somebody. So we're going to have a few speakers. And one of them will be somebody who makes AI cry. <laughs> So, yeah, if you want to see that, come to the next meetup. There's going to hopefully be somebody who trusts AI to make you money, somebody who looks at traffic a lot, and somebody who keeps their servers next to the sink. And you'll find out why <laughs> in the next meetup. So thank you all for coming. Please send me your feedback messages. Your feedback is really important for us. Just drop me a message letting us know, was it too complex, too easy? What would you like else to see? If it was too long or too short. Thank you very much. Bye.